you are wondering what has provoked the nations to embrace anger and chaos why are the people making plans to pursue their own vacant and empty greatness leaders of nations stand united rulers put their heads together plotting against the eternal one and his anointed king trying to figure out how they can throw off the gentle reign of god's love step out from under the restrictions of his claims to advance their own schemes at first the power of heaven laughs at their silliness the eternal mocks their ignorant selfishness but his laughter turns to rage and he rebukes them as god displays his righteous anger they begin to know the meaning of fear he says i am the one who appointed my king who reigns from zion my mount of holiness he is the one in charge i am telling all of you the truth i have heard the eternal's decree he said clearly to me you are my son today i have become your father the nations shall be asking shall be yours for the asking and the entire earth will belong to you they are yours to crush with an iron scepter yours to shatter like fragile clay pots so leaders kings and judges be wise and be warned there is only one god the eternal worship him with respect and awe take delight in him and tremble bow down before god's son if you don't you will face his anger and retribution and you won't stand a chance for it doesn't take long to kindle royal wrath but blessings await all who trust in him they will find god a gentle refuge this is god's word i like that translation from the voice it just seemed to put it together uh but if you have your bibles follow with me in psalm 2 as you guess that surpasses this morning and as if this is a theme that's been on my heart these past few weeks there were two themes that kind of uh sort of kept coming through the christmas season one was mary's unconditional obedience which we looked at two weeks ago and how she says yes even when she doesn't know the full outcome but the second was the disconnect between this message of christmas the joy to the world that we kept singing about and the world around us and even many friends uh that i have on facebook people were writing not christians but asking you what is this all about what, there doesn't seem the two just don't seem to add up right where we live in a world that seems to be getting from bad to worse and uh, there's chaos all around and where does this message of christmas uh, fit into that and i remember the lord brought the passage of the uh, you know herod's uh, massacre to mind and that was in the first christmas and we don't see that on many christmas cards right pictures of babies being slaughtered but that's part of the christmas story and this disconnect has existed from a long time but even as we closed the last few weeks especially last week the service joy to the world and we sang he rules the world right and we sang it loudly and we sang it faithfully but really as we stepped out of that door and we stepped into the world do we really believe do we see that this he ruled the world and on christmas day we were reminded that the government is on his shoulder but if it is then what's happening around us right because the government that we see does not seem to reflect that truth at all and there seems to be this disconnect and psalm 2 i think addresses that and this is a passage that the lord laid on my heart to share with you this morning because in psalm 1 which we read we read about a man who is blessed a man who chooses to follow god's path but in psalm 2 we read about the world in which he lives 
right? Sometimes when we can read Psalm 1, we think, well, we'll also, you know, be walking around streams of water and green. No, that doesn't happen, right? By choosing that path, and as we go through the book of Psalms, we see that there are challenges the psalmist faces. There are times of depression. There are challenges. There are threats to his kingdom, as we read in Psalm 2. And it takes him right through that till we get to Psalm 150, where he says, let everything praise. He's gone through it all, but he still knows that, you know, God is in heaven and God is in his sanctuary. And in Psalm 2, he says, well, why? Why do, are the nations raging? What is there? What is there in this thing that they are, seem to be so set against him? He says, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings or leaders of the world, they set them up. They take advice together. They take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. They say, let us break the bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. The Hebrew word, and this is a passage that... Uh, the apostles take up in Acts chapter 4, again, when they're before the council, right? And they're being pressured and they say, you know, why, Lord, why do the nations rage? Right? Because they have the same question. It was true then, it was true in David's time, it was true in the New Testament time, and it's true now. This is not something new. This disconnect that we see around us has been there from time immemorial. The nations have been raging from the very first day, from the time of Cain onward. There's been this disconnect, this anger, this seeking to step out of the purview and the control of God, of the boundaries that God has given us. And the word that is used here for rage, the Hebrew word, is that of a stormy sea. It's the way, winds blowing, the waves roaring. And it's like, why are they? Why is that froth happening? There's a lot of surf over there. And Paul, when he uh, talks about it later in Acts, he uses the same verse again. It's the sound of, he uses the phrase of a horse that's neighing for battle. Okay, it's, it's uh, straining at the, uh, at the leash and it wants to go. And in that, that's the thing we see around us. There seems to be so much sound and fury, right? Why is it that people find the, uh, the love of God, the control of God so offensive? Why is it that the Christianity, there's so much against us? Why is there so much hatred against the restraints? of godliness, that they would say, let us break out of the chains and free ourselves from slavery to God, as one translation puts it. Because I believe, beloved, that if we accept God who he is, and if we accept that he's on the throne, then the logical response is that we must bow the knee. And as human beings, we don't want to bow the knee. We do not want to bow the knee. We want to be gods on our own, right? That has been the curse from the Garden of Eden. Right? When Eve wanted to be equal with God, and that has gone on. And that is what Satan has been doing in this world ever since then. To give us this false sense that we don't need to obey God. We can be God in our own right. Whatever you look around us, some faith will say that God is in us, something, but it basically comes down to the fact that we don't need to bow the knee. And there is, and that is really where it comes, the rubber hits the road. And this is something that we see through the ages. You remember when Jesus was born, Herod tried his best to uh, do it because he didn't want to accept the king of the Jews that had been born in Jerusalem. The Roman emperor Diocletian, he tried to wipe out Christianity and he even put up a pillar, uh, two pillars again, celebrating his success. Well, we know how successful he was. He is gone. But there's always been this deep-seated animosity against God and the people of God and God's claim on their lives. Isaiah 59, writing so many hundred years before Christ, he said, they hatch adder's eggs and weave spider's webs. That's what God thinks about it. There are all the plans there, but they're really nothing more than flimsy spider's webs. They can't hold together. The leaders of the world may get together and they still do. We shouldn't be surprised today when we see that happening around us. This is nothing new. Right? It's been going on and it will continue to go on until the day when Christ returns and takes the physical throne which he sits on today. But yes, beloved, we need to remember that he rules the world. He still does, even though the leaders of the world around us. And we are perhaps going to see more of this as we, even in our lifetime as the days go ahead. And I believe God is telling us that, look, he's not surprised. We may be surprised, but he's not surprised. He says it's futile. It's, it's pointless. And so the psalm begins with this almost angry question, why? Why is it? 
I did a search on you, uh, Yahoo and said, Look, why, uh, you know, is uh, Christianity so offensive? Why do people hate God? And the answers, you know, there's so many. But they largely fall into two categories. One is people who say that, look, as people of God, we have been a very poor representative of God. And that's true for the most part. But usually that hides the second reason, which is a true reason. And that is, look, we don't need God. People say, well, if they preach a message that says, I need God, I don't need God. They say, I need salvation, but I don't need salvation. Because if I do, then I must bow the knee. And that's really where the bottom line is. And the kings of the earth have set themselves together, or the leaders stand united to put their heads together. In determination, they get together, they collude together, they plan their opposition to God. This is not a deep, a temporary rage, but a deep-seated hate, an animosity. They set themselves resolutely to withstand the Prince of Peace. The psalmist says they take counsel together. They go about their warfare craftily, not with foolish hate, but deliberately. We shouldn't be surprised when we see that around us, because this is something that Satan has been involved with from the very beginning. Charles Spurgeon said, Oh, that men were half as careful in God's service to serve him wisely as his enemies are to attack his kingdom craftily. Sinners have their wits about them, and yet saints are dull. So often, the world puts much more thought and planning into their attacks than we do on speaking about the King of Kings and the truth that we know, right? And we take it so much for granted. <coughs> the prayer this morning is that we would see it for what it is, not to be taken in, not to be overwhelmed, but we would see it, that these are plans, these are things that are working on, there is deep-seated thought. Yesterday's paper, I was surprised to see someone like Mohandas Pai, who's a respected person in the business community, talking against Christianity and conversions. This is something that runs deep, and we shouldn't be surprised. And it's going to come all around us, but we know that he rules the world, he's on the throne. But what's it about? They say, let us break the chains. Let us be free to do all manner what we want. Let us be our own gods. Let's get rid of the constraint. Let us free ourselves. They want to free themselves from God. God has given his rules. He has given his creation. And he has set boundaries around that. And we see this all around us, not just in the political sphere. We see it in the social sphere, the attack on marriage. Because God has defined marriage for what's it at. But today man wants to redefine it. Because they don't want to be constrained by the limits that God puts on marriage. We see that in the economic uh, world. We see it in the way we deal with our creation that God has given us, the resources, our relationship with each other. Wherever it is, God has set rules and boundaries and man doesn't want to stay in that space. And so we want to push it, we want to rewrite it. And while we can look at this and look at them and say, you know, these guys are like that, even as I read it, it the Spirit, God convicts me. Because so often, we may not be so in our face, but at, in our own hearts, so often we too, we want to push it back. We really don't want to do what God wants us to do. We would like to take his advice, but we really don't want to follow through. And where it doesn't agree with our thought process, we too would like to break off the cords and ask him to give us a bit more space than he's given to us. And as we look at history, there are kings and queens and rulers and judges who have done this over the years, and history is full of that. Uh, we think of so many people, right from Voltaire and all, who thought Christianity would be dead, but they have been consigned to the dustbin of history. And even in today, those people will still exist, and they do exist. And it will continue until that day when Christ's reign is truly consummated. Until there will be a terrible struggle of the nations, he will come as a refiner with fire, and then earth, which does not accept its rightful monarch, will, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. But today, beloved, we have that choice of willingly bowing the knee. To a graceless neck, the yoke of Christ is intolerable, but to the saved sinner, it is easy and light. And perhaps as we look in our own lives, we can see where we stand in this. Do we fight the yoke or do we find it light and easy to bear. But the psalmist goes on. He doesn't just stop there. And while he wonders why this is happening around him, the Spirit of God then takes him 
uh, into the throne room itself. And in verse 4 and 5, we see, He who sits in the heavens will laugh. The Lord holds them in derision. The Lord laughs at it. Just imagine, we know much more about the universe today than the psalmist did. The scale of the universe. When he looked at the stars, he could see a couple of hundred, a couple of thousand. Today we know about the Milky Way and the galaxies and all beyond that. And the God who sits in the heaven and he sees earth, infinite, small, minute, minuscule to the whole scale of uh, the, the universe. And in that, these puny guys sitting there waving their hands and uh, clenching their fists against him. And the Lord laughs. And uh, my Bible was say this morning, sh the, the word that is used here is like a father who laughs at his three-year-old. When his three-year-old says, Dad, I'm stronger than you. Yeah, I know it, yeah. Right? And the father doesn't, he, there's no threat to that. Right? He takes it and he laughs. One day the child will realize. But that's how it is. God sits on his throne and he laughs. This is no threat to him, beloved. He is in control. And we can truly continuously sing, He rules the world. And the government is on his shoulder. And so the psalmist takes us through the Spirit of God into the throne room, into the council chamber. And the Lord looks at them and he says, he laughs, but then his laughter turns into derision. It turns into scorn, right? As he looks at it and he sees these puny men punching the air, waving their hands and trying to take on the Almighty. God is still on his throne. He's not upset. He's not ruffled. And the contempt that he pours is indicative of his stature and the attacks on him. He despises them. He knows how absurd it is, how irrational it is. And therefore he laughs at them. But then the anger, laughter turns to anger because the king is on the throne. As we've sung recently, Handel's Messiah reminds us that he will reign forever and ever. And his kingdom will go on. And he is there. And so he says, he starts to speak. And he says, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. He speaks to them. He has disposed of the matter. He has already placed his chosen king on the throne in Jerusalem. Isn't that great, beloved? He's already done that, just that which the enemy seeks to prevent. While they're ranting and raving, and they'll continue to rant and rave, and they are proposing, God has already disposed of the matter. He has placed his king on the throne in Jerusalem. Just as David took it in his context, perhaps David at this time was under attack from some of the nations around him, but God reassures him that he's placed his king in Jerusalem, and he's secure, and that can be a comfort to us. I don't know where you are this morning, but perhaps you're in a place where you feel under attack. If God has placed you there, you're invincible. You're secure because God has placed you. But overall, God has placed his son on the throne. And that is impregnable. That can never be touched. And his son is on the throne and he rules the world. Jesus will reign where'er the son that his successive journeys run. Jehovah's will is being done and will be done and will always be done. And man can fret and rave and wane. God's anointed is already appointed on the throne. Look back through all the ages and through all the bit times and the dark ages and the middle ages and yet we can see that God has always been in control and God has remained on the throne. He hasn't yet stepped off the throne and he never will. He says, yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion and one day he will see the travail of his soul and he will be satisfied. Even now he raised in Zion. And we can worship him this morning. Every word that we've sung, we know is resoundingly true. Our God is great and he sits on the throne. And we can worship him in confidence. There may be greater conflicts ahead. We know that the same psalm is quoted three times in the book of Revelation. Where we're reminded that one day he will the same king that's talked about will crush the nations as a potter crushes the uh, clay. And he will rule with the iron scepter. If we have any doubt that this refers to the Lord, this revelation takes it up again. And one day he will sit and think. But in the meantime, he guards all that is his. And so we as citizens of that heavenly kingdom 
can indeed be glad. We can sing with confidence, majesty, majesty. Kingdom authority flows from his throne unto his own. Let him be praised. Beloved, that authority is ours this morning and we can take claim it with confidence. And then we are given a glimpse of this conversation between the father and the son. And the father talking to the son and the son repeating in verses 7 to 9. He says, today I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. We see the two persons of the Trinity over here, even in the Old Testament, talking to each other and God announcing that he has given the kingdom to his son and his son telling us that it is his. God laughs and he says that I have already declared my son to be God with power according to the spirit of holiness and the resurrection from the dead. Looking at the angry, rebellious kings, the anointed one says, if this is not enough to make you silent, let me tell you what I've decreed. I've decreed it. And his decree is directly in conflict with the device of man. Because while they are saying, let's throw it off, God is saying to his son, thou art my son. Here, and he, Hebrews 1 takes that passage and says, to which of the angels has he at any time said, thou art my son? Uh, the writer of the Hebrews remind us that he's far superior to anyone else. God has given him that authority. God has placed him at his right hand. And today that's where he sits. What a mercy, beloved. What a confidence we have this morning. That as we come into the throne, we come to one who not only knows us, who is felt with every weakness that we feel, but he also sits at the right hand of the throne with all the authority and power that God has given him. And God tells him, today I've become your father. And then the Lord tells, the father tells the son, ask of me. It was a custom, as you know, in the old days for kings to say, well, as part of things, ask of me whatever you want up to half my kingdom and I'll give it to you. Remember Esther, when she goes before the king, the king is pleased with her and he says, ask of me. Herod, when Herodias danced for him, he said, ask of me. And the father asks, tells the son, ask of me and I will give it to you. Not just half the kingdom, he has given him the throne. And so he declares to the son that the enemies, the same ones that are waving their fists in his face, have been given to him as an inheritance. Lo, he says, here, he has given me this, and not only the right to be king, but the power to conquer. Jehovah has given to his anointed son a rod of strength. These people that are, we see around us and sometimes seem to overwhelm us, Let's remember it's nothing but potter's clay, easily dashed to pieces of uh, clay and empty pots. Potter's vessels are not restored if they're dashed in pieces. And the ruin of sinners will be hopeless if Jesus smites them. Let us remember this morning that all other gods that we see around us are squatters today in territory that is not their own. This is our Father's world. And we can say that with confidence and we can move in that confidence. The psalmist doesn't really answer the question why they conspire, but he tells us how God responds when they do uh, conspire against him. But what does that mean to you and me this morning? As we come to the end of this year, as we go into a new year, if the Lord tarries, what does it mean to us? I believe that it tells us, in, as we see in verses 10 to 12, that the psalmist pleads with the world, the kings around him. He says, get real. This antagonism that we see is not the end of the story. The scene changes and there's a counsel to them. They're exhorted to obey. They're exhorted to kiss uh, the son, to acknowledge him for whom he is and to give him the obedience, the affection, the uh, adoration that is his by right, whom they hate today. But what for us? I believe three things that we can take away from this. First, how do you and I see the people around us? Do we see them as those just who are angry, as hateful, as those sometimes I too, like the psalmist, pray, Lord, you know, it'd be nice if you could take that scepter and dash them to pieces today, right? I think we've all been there and the psalmist prays that too. But that's not God's heart as we read that, right? God is still patient. Even as he sits on the throne, even as he looks at them, even as he laughs for them, right? He still has no desire in crushing them. 
The psalmist says he has no desire. That's not his heart. He came with Christmas that we've just celebrated was because he didn't, wouldn't, couldn't bear to see the same people that wave their fists at him actually going to a Christless eternity. They will go to an eternity only because they rejected what God has done. It has never been his plan. We know from ages past he wanted to send his son. Even this week as we were at a Christmas event one evening and we were thinking of the son coming. And to me the thought was if somebody asked me to give up Kia even for something small and put her in that place of danger, it would be something that would be impossible to conceive. And yet the father sent his son knowing whom he was sending them to knowing that these people who were ranting and raving were waiting to do away with him, to pour scorn on him, to take him to a cross, these same ones, and yet his love goes that far. And as I look in my own life, and I pray as you look in yours, do we have that love that the Father has? Despite their conspiracy, despite their arrogance, despite their pride, his love goes out to them. Do we love them like that? This beloved evangelism is not just for the evangelists evangelism is for each one of us God has placed us with these people around us sometimes they're not very lovable but he has placed us in their midst and asks us to share his love with them do you and I see them as people on a way to a Christless eternity and that God has given his life for them and he does not wish to dash them to pieces secondly how do we see ourselves what is our role in this? Our Father has made a promise to our Savior as we saw. We are now redeemed. We are no longer our own. And we exist today to see this promise of our Heavenly Father to our Heavenly Brother fulfilled. God has kept us on this earth to proclaim the kingdom. One day his kingdom will come, but even today we can pray that. right? And we can bring his will on earth as it is in heaven. And it starts in our own hearts does that happen in ourselves? Does it happen here in this church before it happens rest of the world? How do we see ourselves? Are we furthering the kingdom or are we those who are pushing people away? May it not be that any of us would be the reason why someone would say this is why I hate Christianity. And thirdly, how do we see God? The Bible says he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked and we see that backed up in the cross. He went to the cross. From heaven he came to the crib, to the cross, and back to heaven. And he has made every provision for every single rebellious person. Leader, ruler, judges, each one of us. Each one of us have been there at one time. But God has saved us. And we have experienced his love in our life. Beloved, we serve a loving God. While he is a fearful God, Sometimes I think the image that the world has around us is of this angry God. And God has revealed himself to us today in this age of grace as a God of love. A God who came to the cross. And as I share with some friends, when they say, well, what is this? It doesn't make sense. I said, he sent his own son. While it doesn't make sense, and you and I may be poor examples of that message, the fact still remains he sent his son. We cannot deny the love that he gave. And if he could send his son into this world that made no sense, then we can trust him for the other rest of it. So be wise, as the psalmist says. Let's always be willing to be instructed. The psalmist says, be wise, delay no longer. Let's serve the Lord with fear. Let's rejoice with trembling. Take heed, our Lord is a consuming fire. And so the psalmist closes and he says, Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Today, have we put our trust in him? As we look back over this year, the challenges that we faced, can we say, yes, Lord, I understand, but even those hard pathways you have been able to make fruitful because we were able to trust him. Do we trust him this morning? That's a question for each one of us. Our faith may be slender as a spider's tread, but if it's real, we are in a measure blessed. And the more we trust, the more fully we can know his blessedness. Therefore, we, the psalmist closes with the prayer of the apostles. Lord, increase our faith. That's my prayer this morning. Lord, I want to trust you. I want to have faith with you. I want to be blessed. The first psalm, we see a contrast between a righteous man and a sinner. 
In the second psalm, we see a contrast between the disobedience of the ungodly world and the sure exaltation of the Son of God. In the first psalm, we saw the wicked driven away like chaff. And in the second psalm, we see them broken in pieces like a potter's vessel. The end is certain, beloved. We know that he has written history and finally one day he will close the book. But even today, we may live in a world that doesn't seem to make sense. We may live in a world that seems to be moving away. God is not taken by surprise. He is still in control. And my prayer for each one of us as we go out into that world that we would be able to go in that certainty, operate in that certainty that yes, he rules the world and he will reign wherever the sun. Isaac Watts, perhaps inspired by this psalm, wrote this hymn in 1719, a time when the world was very different and yet very similar. There were different challenges and yet evil seemed to still be all over. But it was a different kind of world then. And he wrote this and some of the verses we don't see in our hymn book today. I'm going to read it for you. And they weren't, may not be politically correct, but this is what he wrote and it's still true. And I believe it pulls together exactly what the Lord's sharing with us this morning. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does his successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more. Behold the islands with their kings and Europe her best tribute brings. From north to south the princes meet to pay their homage at his feet. Their Persia glorious to behold, their India shines in eastern gold and barbarous nations at his word submit to bow and own their Lord. And beloved, that will come true. To him shall endless prayer be made and praises throng to crown his head. His name like sweet perfume shall rise with every morning sacrifice. People and realms of every tongue dwell on his love with sweetest song and infant voices shall proclaim their early blessings on his name. Blessings abound where'er he reigns. The prisoner leaps to loose his chains. The weary find eternal rest and all the sons of want are blessed. Where he displays his healing power, death and curse are known no more. In him the tribes of Adam boast more blessings than their father lost. Let every creature rise and bring peculiar honors to our king. Angels descend with songs again, and earth repeat the loud Amen. Great God, whose universal sway the known and unknown worlds obey, now give the kingdom to thy son, extend his power, exalt his throne. The scepter well becomes his hands, all heaven submits to his commands. His justice shall avenge the poor, and pride and rage prevail no more. With power he vindicates the just, and treads the oppressor in the dust. His worship and his fear shall last, till hours and years and time be past. Let's pray. Father, we look forward to that day, Lord, when your kingdom will come and your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But Lord, we know that that's a certainty. And till then, Father, we pray that we would do all that you have placed us to do in this place, in this season that you have brought us into, Lord. You have brought us into this time of history in your perfect will. Lord, we thank you that you are on the throne. We thank you that we can sing in assurance he rules the world. Lord, the government is on your shoulder. And Lord, I pray that that peace, that confidence would be our portion today and always. In Jesus' name, amen.